Today we've got Sean from Webpack, who I'm very excited to hear from. Webpack is, uh, turn, has turned into our biggest collective in terms of the budget, and they've done some really cool and creative stuff um, to raise funds and um, basically just kick this whole sustainability for open source to a whole new level. I'd like to turn it over now to Sean to introduce himself a bit and Webpack a bit and tell us, tell us your story. How's it going? <laughs> um, yeah, what's up, guys? Uh, so some of you might know me. Um, I'm Sean Larkin. Now, I just put a couple slides together that are going to cover some really, really, really high level topics. Um, and it should maybe only take about 10 to 15 minutes. But I think that it kind of touches on the nuances uh, behind, you know, our story and kind of where we've come since 2012 as an open source project to today. And um, some of the things that we've done along the way that at least I feel or our organization feels has been incredibly impactful. Um, and they kind of focus around a few different things. So, um, you know, a little bit about myself. I'm a program manager uh, for the Microsoft Web Platform and I'm working on Edge Dev Tools. Um, but as you know, I'm also one of the maintainers of Webpack, and I very much uh, fit into the developer advocate role uh, there for the for the org. Um, I do I did do some work on the Angular CLI and so the Angular core team, and uh, I'm also just an evangelist for open source sustainability. I think the the success that we've had here at Webpack, we want to not be a, a unique story, and um, so I've been doing what I can. Um, time permitted to kind of help continue to evangelize uh, other maintainers and get them excited about trying to work on making their projects uh, more known or uh, well-funded. So um, as you know, uh, we use Open Collective as a driver for um, the ability to fund our organization. And so, um, you know, we, we have our open source collective. If you haven't seen it, it's opencollective.com slash webpack. Um, but I wanted to give just a really high level history of where webpack started. So um, in 2012 in March, uh, Tobias Coppers, also known as at Socra on GitHub, started creating webpack uh, actually for a thesis project, but not focused on webpack um, based on an abandoned PR. And um, that abandoned PR was for a a library called Modules WebMake, which essentially was, you know, a, you know, Webpack was forked, uh, basically to, to create it for Modules WebMake and to add the feature code splitting. Um, and then in 2012, uh, React Hotloader shows up. Dan Abramoff, you can look at the Stack Overflow, um, uh, I guess, questions in where, you know, Dan Abramoff, who's, you know, on the React core team and helps maintain uh, Redux and create React app. Uh, he's there answering a bunch of elementary Webpack questions, and you can kind of see this very slow incline in interest throughout, you know, notable members of the community. And then in 2014, uh, Webpack One was noticed by Pete Hunt, and at OSCON West, he introduced Webpack to the entire universe, I guess. Um, uh, basically showing an architecture of how Instagram was built and uh, using Webpack and why it was so beneficial in comparison to the other things that they were working on. Um, we kind of see this point as the explosion of Webpack's popularity. Now, at a small scale, it's really not that uh, large, but it is where kind of the React community started to adopt Webpack pretty slowly. And then in 2016, um, <laughs> Well, I guess I'll fill in the gaps between before 2016. So um, I had been experienced Webpack for the first time uh, as a UX developer at a con contracting company. And I was obsessed with the experience after never using it before. Um, and after having the opportunity to speak at a conference about it, I had discovered that nobody in the Angular ecosystem understood what Webpack was or where it came from. And so I kind of put myself out there and reached out to uh, Yuho Vepsiline, who actually created some of these slides you see here, uh, who is also kind of helping maintain Webpack at the time. Um, and I said, hey, I want to get you guys paid. And so he was like, all right, let's create a, a private Gitter chat and pull in all the maintainers at the time. And so I, I did that and I said, hey, I want to get you guys paid. What can I do to, to help? 
uh, out of dumb luck, we had the opportunity <laughs> to be on a podcast, and I got on there just to be a panelist, but the day of the podcast, um, I guess Kent Dodds had posted a graphic that you see below in the slide that shows the Webpack core team or the Webpack team. And my face is just there. And you know, we had never talked about this, but this was my first involvement with Webpack. Uh, and so you see there, 2016 July, the Webpack core team established. And uh, that's when I became a maintainer. Um, in two, 2016, we wanted to release Webpack 2, but we wanted to have something, kind of a revitalization of kind of our image and our branding and, and everything. Um, and so Open Collective, uh, we got in touch with Pia uh, Mancini, and that's kind of where we uh, started to join Open Collective and really push for a transparent funding model. And then finally, we were able to finish our documentation and release Webpack 2. And then since then, things really started to continue to increase at, at a really rapid pace. You know, we were trying to reach, you know, $100,000 in the first year of our funding. Um, and we were able to get $80,000 of an estimated annual budget uh, by March, so in three months. And then uh, Yuho releases uh, Survive.js uh, Webpack, which is a 500 page uh, guide to using Webpack um, that was complementary to our documentation, um, but also help to help drive his, um, his contracting or his uh, consulting for Webpack. Uh, then uh, 2017, we released Webpack 3. So you can see a huge difference between Webpack 1 and 2, and then also 2 and 3. And then by August 2017, we've now been able to move our budget over a quarter of a million dollars um, due to not only open collective funds, but also a grant from Mozilla uh, for $125,000 and a very large sponsorship uh, with Trivago for $12,000 a month. And so you guys are like, I don't care, Sean, how? How did you do it? Tell me everything. Um, and kind of like you saw on the slide, it was about changing, everything that we've done here is about changing the culture. Um, Webpack, uh, before this moment here, represented um, just a project that was maintained by, by one person and um, really who worked on it for five hours a day. And this, this maintainer, Tobias, was a full-time C-sharp developer who uh, made industrial CT machines or the software for it. <laughs> and so um, this not only represented a change in uh, the support and the active uh, or the activity for development, but how we reached out to people, um, how we were starting to publish meeting notes. Uh, it was how we were starting to reach out to people on Twitter, uh, as well as the pace and um, how much we also started to recruit for people to be involved in the project. And so, you know, some of these things, you know, like our medium publication um, is probably the most active that it's ever been. And we have a whole different sets of types of articles. Not only are we publishing content ourselves and we try to at least four times a month or three times a month, um, but we also, uh, I am constantly looking on Twitter for great articles from people um, especially, you know, people who are underrepresented in the community um, and having those posts uh, hosted on our publication. Um, what's so important about Medium is that it allows your open source project to aggregate and really take over mind share of quality, quality articles or content creation for a specific tool, in our case, Webpack. Um, what sometimes you'll see is when a when an open source project comes out or it gets kind of hot, you tend to notice random people start popping up trying to aggregate and push out a bunch of cheap five cent, uh, five cent articles and feeds. Um, and these things we try to stop instantly. Like if you were to search Webpack, you don't ever see like a Webpack bits, webpacknews.com. It is our Webpack medium and we've monopolized the kind of spread out of this content creation. And so, uh, I always recommend to people who are trying to build their kind of identity or their image to start doing things like create a medium page, create something that's easily accessible um, and prevent, <clears throat> prevent that kind of identity from being spread across by multiple random authors, uh, et cetera. So, and then outreach, this was something that was super important to me. Um, 
and uh, very much a quality that I guess maybe I fall into just well because I'm a talky person. I like interacting with people. Um, but one of the first things I did after becoming a maintainer was like, I was too terrified to make code changes. I didn't know how it worked. And so I was like, well, Sean, what can you do uh, that you can, you know, kick ass at and you know that you'll do well. And so essentially I just got on Twitter and I literally just spent hours a day searching Webpack. And back in 2015, the, there were a lot of very callous messages about Webpack. Um, and it was so very obvious that it was like, wow, you know, there is a, there's a collective mindset on how things are in the state of the project. Um, and so like literally it just started by me responding and saying like, Hey, can I help? Or, Hey, you know, you know, is there any way that we can help or take your feedback? Or, um, if it's somebody who is especially difficult, you know, it's like, Hey, this would be a great opportunity for you to contribute or maybe get something in a GitHub issue. Um, most of the time it's people just wanting to be heard. Um, people wanting to be listened to. And I think, I don't know if this was something that's been popular in the past, but I like to think that we kind of set the, set the standard for, um, you know, for an open source project doing something like this outside of one that's actually funded or that's a framework that's backed by a company. Um, you know, this was very specific to, you know, a grassroots project who really is trying to show people that we care about your voice and you represent what makes, you know, Webpack great. And another one is user governance. Um, so what's something very unique for our project, or maybe it's not, uh, is that we have this uh, voting page. So webpack.js.org forward slash vote. Um, and basically what happens is you log in with a GitHub account and for every day, um, any GitHub user gets one vote or one point. And we call that influence. And so there is a list of features that uh, you can vote on to prioritize or uh, to choose for, you know, that you want to be supported. And so it's giving people, who, I mean, literally the users, the power to decide what we are going to focus on and work on. Uh, so essentially for the last, ever since we released uh, Webpack 2, we created this so that we could um, allow the users to be completely in control um, in one stretch or the, you know, in, in one way or another of kind of how our project is going to be shaped for the future. And then we have golden influence. So for any backer or sponsor in our project, um, we give one golden influence for each dollar they've ever contributed. And you can tell they're based on the slide is that golden influence is a hundred times, you know, stronger than a normal influencer. It's one to a hundred. And so this way we have the ability to not only give a stronger priority to those who have sponsored us or backed us in some way, um, but also at the same time, not being so strong that it outweighs, you know, the voice of the greater collective of, of people who use and contribute to, you know, the project. But another thing is transparency. So, um, you know, we wanted to keep people up to date on what is going on in our project. And so um, ever since we were able to grow our budget large enough to fund for example, Tobias full time to work on Webpack. Um, you know, we we made a promise that we would keep people up to date on what they are working on, um, and so then that way, uh, people have the ability to actually see and uh, you know what what are we doing behind the scenes and what are the architectural challenges and and, and so we put that on our medium page. This is one of our um, more active. Uh, our active kind of weekly logbooks. Um, and on top of that, we use Open Collective to also be transparent. So like that's one of our, maybe our favorite choices is that every transaction, whether it is a sponsorship or a backer, et cetera, everything is able to be tracked um, by the public as a whole. And so if something was to be scrutinized or, you know, we know that, um, you know, we have this information on paper that anybody can see the work that's being done on the project. Uh, I mean, I cannot stress how important this is to me. Um, and I really think that this has been one of the strongest influences on our project, which is, um, and it's kind of evangelism related, but it, it all is surrounded, uh, centered around just love. Uh, it may sound cheesy uh, or corny uh, to some, but <clears throat> what I found is that the greatest kind of weapon or tool or power that you have for your users or haters or trolls in your project is love. Um, you know, that's just an example 
Uh, really, a lot of time people just want to vent, but if you show them that you care, they're happy to help. Um, or, <laughs> um, you know, a, lo a lot of times people are just having a bad day. Um, or, you know, just need to, to be pointed in the right direction. Um, and, and love is so important in that, you know, we take it to like the nth extreme where if there's ever a, uh, or for most times, if there's ever like a, an article or anything that drops, <laughs> there's an article that drops on, um, you know, Reddit or Hacker News. Like one of the first things I do is I instantly try and be the first one to comment and say, hey, thank you so much for hosting this. <clears throat> you know, we really appreciate the support that we've gotten from this community. Or typically, you know, these days we've seen most webpack posts have usually no or any negative comments in, you know, on these posts. And so like coming from a place like Reddit or coming from a place like Hacker News is really powerful to me um, and really speaks, speaks words, uh, you know, to know that like, if you just show that you really care about what the users, you know, what the user is trying to accomplish, or you really empathize with, you know, what their day-to-day -day challenges are, is that most of the time, these are small steps that you take to really change not only the culture, but um, the perception of Webpack as a whole. Even with trolls, we try to, you know, just say like, we'd love your help and we're sorry that this is happening. Um, most people understand that you're human. Um, I think maybe we have an edge as a, as grassroots projects who don't have large companies behind them um, because we can even make mistakes and publish bugs or breaking changes and you know a lot of times as long as we're we're open and helpful about it uh, you know people will really just like yeah so I pack it's okay we love them that you're not only reaching out to people um, but you're also reaching out to project managers you're also reaching out to to you know CEOs and uh, CTOs really showing that you want to change you know Changing the culture and the mindset also, uh, you know, is, is going to be by doubling down on investment like uh, our open collective. When it comes to funding, partnerships first. So like I've, I've never ever once talked about money. Like when it comes to funding, funding is the last piece that I ever worry about. The first thing I usually worry about is, you know, what is this person's need? What are they trying to accomplish? And how can we help? accommodate or deliver on those unmet needs or challenges that they have. Um, and then two is uh, sometimes you have to make a play or think long-term strategy for your project. Uh, it may sound silly as a open source project, but um, sustainability is really important and preventing the next great tool uh, is not what we're out to do, but finding out why these challenges or why a new tool is popping up to exist. A great example is um, you know, we had found out, uh, you know, actually a year ago, almost to date that WebAssembly was going to be, you know, supported by all browsers. And so I started speaking with some folks at Chrome Dev Summit about, hey, maybe there's a Webpack story here. Um, you know, who's the key stakeholders? And they're like, we well, should talk to this person at Mozilla. Um, and we said, you know, like, hey, I really think that there could be a great story here. And so we really created this connection and relationship over time prior to even thinking about a grant. And then to find out that Mozilla did have a grant that would, um, you know, was for open source projects. It was important to me that we chose the right thing to work on because WebAssembly was a pillar feature for Firefox and there's huge incentive behind it. Um, that also meant that it would probably, uh, the likelihood of it being accepted as a grant would probably be a lot higher if we submitted it to Mozilla. You know, um, it's just those little strategies or plays, I guess you could say, um, you know, are, are really important to think about long term. Um, and I mean, for what it's worth, any feature that we're going to work on has to be beneficial to the web and the web ecosystem and every user. Um, and so it's not like you can just go out there and look for like some company needing something landed and, and tell them, hey, let's do it. Uh, you really have to be kind of forward thinking and, and have an idea of what your long term road, roadmap is. Well, thank you so much, Sean. That was yep. really, um, really interesting. I think there's maybe like a couple of different phases that projects go through. So, for example, a project that hasn't started raising money at all and it's just at the very beginning 
um, that's kind of like, I want to ask your advice towards them about why they shouldn't maybe make that jump or how to get started. And then also that other phase where let's say there's like, they've got a budget of like 10 grand a year or something, but they really want to 10 exit and they're ready for that next level. So can you speak to your advice for both of those families? Yeah, absolutely. So if you haven't funded your project before ever, or you're really wanting to think about funding it, um, I think the first thing to do is, <clears throat> is kind of understand what you're going to do when you're funded or like, let's say you end up with $20,000, what is going to happen with it? Um, for us, uh, Webpack, we have kind of two ideals or um, we believe that anybody who wants to work on open source should, should be able to be supported. And so uh, no matter if it's 20 hours or 40 hours, uh, we think that they shouldn't have to find a job that supports open source, that we can be, you know, we can help them um, be able to work on the project and then allow them to expense that work that they've done. Not only uh, did I want to be able to fund Tobias, who really wanted to be able to work on the project because he loved working on it, but he also wanted to be able to do it and, you know, sustain himself every day. And so uh, that was, that was one, one thing. And then also, you know, I was in the situation at the time where it was like, I, you know, I have a stable job, but I really want to be able to put in, um, you know, the time that I can and still justify that time that I've worked on it. Um, and I want that for anybody. So, uh, you know, being able to fairly kind of distribute those funds, you know, th those were our two initial goals. And so kind of having, you know, kind of laying out, you know, initial, like not even a roadmap, but just kind of having an outline for what you want. So like, why are you going to be raising the money? What specifically, you know, are you going to fund? Are you funding time? Are you going to fund infrastructure for your project? Do you want to host on Travis, you know, with extra, you know, parallelism? Uh, do you want to help uh, fund events or fund speakers or, you know, um, help fund meetups? There's so many different things. And I think maybe focusing on two or three will allow you to really um, identify the needs and, and create a budget so that you can forecast what kind of, you know, funding you're going to have to approach. For projects that are like, hey, we, we've got some money and now what do we do? Um, I think Babel is one of the ones that pops in my head all the time. I know Henry uh, it has done an incredible job with the community side and really wrangling in contributors to help on the project. Um, and I think, so this is where maybe partnerships first comes to mind. Um, so now that you're at a place where, you know, you have the established kind of, you know, initial funding, uh, I think the first thing you want to do is just get out there and meet people and find out companies that are using it or just reach out to individual developers who work for important companies and say like, hey, what are your biggest challenges with Babel? And it's this, 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 this. And then, you know, maybe over a few weeks of kind of strengthening that partnership or that bond between this person, um, then talk about maybe, uh, you know, things like, uh, collaborating on potential features that, you know, could benefit everyone or, you know, really just building up the connection with that person and then that entity and that organization to then start saying like, Hey, this would be an awesome sponsorship opportunity, or maybe there, maybe you want to be officially, you know, sponsor, you know, maybe you can get better publicity out there. We want to share with people that you love Babel and you support our open source project. And so, Maybe this is a great way to get marketing to find new jobs um, and, and really showing people that it's never a charity, but it's something that you can get in return, even if it's not something you can immediately expense or, um, or, or maybe you can, it really just depends. But I think starting with partnerships is the most important. Um, with Trivago, we had known, you know, we had communicated with them for two years. Um, initially they wanted, uh, you know, they had Tobias come out there and, and showed them their workflow and their environment. Um, and even, uh, you know, they were looking to hire somebody full time to help, you know, kind of maintain these things or, or work on it. Um, but they're just strong believers in Webpack. And I think the connections that we've made with them in over two years really kind of helped solidify, you know, their sponsorship, uh, to happen. Um, and always kind of staying positive in the community. So like, 
<clears throat> something that I try to, to really put, nip in the butt instantly is anytime anybody is trying to say, oh, wow, you people should be funding this project more, or um, wow, Sean, why don't you charge a license for this? Um, because anytime that you start focusing on the money first, you're always gonna lose out. Because really, it's more important to have the positive and inspiring s sentiment, uh, which can be so much more valuable than you know the monetary figures that are behind it. So we always, 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 you know, there are people who tweet sometimes, I'm just like, please stop. You know, we are, we are super happy with what we have and it's never about the money first. And, and we honestly believe that. Um, we really wanna show people that we genuinely first give a shit about you and your needs um, and then really seeing how can you get something in return by being a sponsor for us. One thing that I've heard from some people is, I'm a developer, I really just wanna code. That's why I started this project. And you're talking about marketing, sales, branding, storytelling, comms, like relationship building. And um, you say you're a people person. And I'm just wondering, is this about maybe more diverse teams working on the project? Is this about people getting out of their comfort zone or learning these new skills? Like, what do you think? Because sometimes, developers don't think of those skills first when they think of what they most want to be doing? I think it's like a mix of everything. Um, you know, I, it just happened that, you know, I am just obsessed with Webpack because the first taste that hit my tongue when I started using it was the most awesome goosebump giving experience I ever had when it came to web dev and it was just pure joy. And so like, I could never stop obsessing about it. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think total like, for me to help people though, I, you know, or to reach out on Twitter, generally, you know, I have to have a front and back knowledge of the tool. And so, um, but I didn't have to have it right away. Uh, but like, as I wanted to speak more at conferences, um, which I enjoy doing, I think that's like, uh, you know, I really wanted to challenge and push the boundaries of how much I knew. Um, and so contributing to the, you know, actually landing commits, like I, I helped, you know, add 10,000 lines or whatever uh, on GitHub, I guess it says. Um, to to help land Webpack 2. And so um, that really helped strengthen that knowledge. But yeah, like um, I think Andrew Goulet on Twitter, you know, says that like communication is, if not equally more important than the code itself, um, especially for an established product or project or product. Um, and I think that, you know, yes, you could absolutely uh, help to, I guess, recruit somebody who is, has external special, you know, specialties in comm and things like that. Um, I also think that it's a really unique touch to have somebody who maintains the project uh, actively have, you know, not only the, the technical savvy, but um, the ability to also work with people. Um, and so a lot of the times, like I've seen Tobias himself, his own growth has been astronomical from where it, it originally started. Uh, Soker didn't even have a Twitter account uh, up until like 2016 or like mid 2016. So like, uh, and sure, like we've all said stupid things on Twitter before, but um, you, I think it really only takes one person to help kind of create the growth and, uh, you know, share those capabilities and skills with each other to really understand how, you know, to interact with people and how to, um, to find others that are equally as passionate. I think it really boils down to the passion. Like I would rather take somebody who is obsessed and loves Webpack first and have zero comm skills that I can, you know, show them the ropes and, you know, help them through that first versus, you know, uh, you know, the latter, which is maybe has excellent comm skills, but really doesn't know anything about Webpack or isn't passionate. Because I think the passion will drive the hard work in the end. Can you just break down um, the different funding streams that you've got coming into your budget? I know you've got, you know, individual backers, you've got company sponsors, but you've also got cool stuff like Webpack Academy and like creative, you know, um, support stuff that you've offered. Like, can you just break this down for me? Tell me the different revenue streams. Yes. Um, so uh, I think let's start from smallest to largest. So Webpack Academy, we have a uh, like, so I have two courses that I put up there. And I think initially I wasn't sure if um, we were going to have it be like a, a pure funding, like a pure platform or model. Uh, one, because I joined Microsoft and, and so a little bit of my extra free time kind of went away. And so I only have two free courses on there, but I have a giving back edition. 
And um, you know, once the the amount is substantial enough, like over like a hundred dollars, uh, I take like thirty percent of all the revenue that I've created from the giving back edition, which is just people paying for it just because they are happy with what they got. Um, and I just put it into the Open Collective under my name. Um, now, there's also things like Threadless, which is our kind of apparel store that we have connected to Open Collective so that we can, we can create and design t-shirts and then people can order them. Now, they're a little bit more expensive because they're kind of like they print on demand kind of deal. Uh, so you're not just ordering a, a, a crap ton of shirts or, or whatnot and, and having them at a nice low price. But uh, what's nice though is that the trade-off is that you get to actually have any of the funds that you get from any profits from there go directly to our open collective and we don't have to manage anything. Um, and so that's really great. That's another just like it's this idea of monopolizing it and aggregating kind of the, the like the things like we sh an open source project should own every curated paid content that's out there. Uh, in some way or another, like it, it's hard to do, especially when you're like, if a project's been out there for a while, like there's a bajillion Angular videos that are paid. But if you start out with a platform, if you're like a growing project, instantly try and create like a video creation or publication um, and even have it as a paid service that pays back your, your project. Um, that way you're not only monopolizing on what quality content means, but then you can onboard people and content creators to actually join and create content for your platform. Like the open source project is not just the code itself, but it's also this platform for content and support and all these kind of things. Um, I guess uh, the other things, so we have backers and sponsors um, and then also grant money. So like grant funding is super important. It, it allows us to get $125,000 for a year, I think, once we start working on it. And so like, that just instantly extends our life um, in means of working on that feature for, for a whole year for the project. Um, and so I think beyond, besides the backers and the sponsors, there's Threadless and um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah, Tobias also went through Segment. And I think, did that get deposited through Open Collective? I'd have to check, but essentially that um, was like a kind of like a scholarship or similar to, um, essentially they they pay out a special project or an individual for working on open source every x months and so um, there's kind of these smaller uh not incentives but things that you can sign up for or uh, be nominated for to be um you know have your work funded for x months on a project and so uh, we try and just stay as keep it as broad as possible and accept any opportunities because it's like uh this kind of model is is really new and so it's hard to you know, put all your eggs in one basket. What's your view of the the larger ecosystem in terms of sustainability for open source? Um, I think a lot of people know there are aspects of it, the way it's done now, which doesn't seem that sustainable. Maybe are we clear about where we need to go? Like, what's your view of how we should have money and sustainability in the open source ecosystem? No big deal, just a small question. Oh, sure. No, it's okay. It's totally, I know, right? Um, I think open source sustainability is broken in, in, in this day and age for every single project that's out there. It has failed since the Linux Foundation and it's maybe the last successful, but that was what, 85, you know, like 25 years ago or however long it was. Um, we're in a completely different age of how people connect and consume and distribute and talk about and monetize off of open source. And so, um, you know, uh, I think that there's two really broken models, which is like forcing people to pay for your product, um, at least in terms of open source sustainability. I don't think that if you force your pro, you know, if you force somebody to pay for your project, uh, especially just like a commercial license, um, you know, I don't have experience with it myself, but I can imagine that that really probably creates churn. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is this other kind of mindset that people believe you should not fund projects, you should fund people, or you should have companies hire people to work on that stuff. Uh, and you know, like, that is, it's just, it's so not common. And so like either you're working on a open source project at a company, which is okay, but 
you're really always going to be trying to fit some business need into the open source project in some way. Um, where we kind of see it opposite, where we are, we have these sponsors and collectives and backers, but we don't represent one individual need or goal besides the users as a whole. Um, and uh, do I think like our funding model is perfect? I don't know. Um, I think every, every project is different and it has these different kind of needs, but this whole mindset of like, you know, a project should only be funded to handle legal issues or it should only be kind of funded to, you know, for infrastructure or, you know, I, I don't, I completely disagree with that. We sh like, you basically strip all the passion out of what people love to do in open source when you tell them, you know, you need to work for a company to work on this project because then it's not what made you happy. Like you're not working on something that made you happy anymore. Like I love Webpack um, and I, I love the day-to-day -day work, the 120 hours I put in a month because I love working with the people and what the product has become and what it will become. And I think like if you, like with the models that have existed in the past, you kind of remove that, like you remove that piece of like, what makes you know open source special. And so I think that we should really be trying to fund people, you know, from the project level so that anybody can have those same blessings that, you know, have been afforded to me or to Tobias or anybody else who's in our organization who's seen their career grown just from working on our project. Um, especially those who don't even have the ability, you know, to hardly sustain themselves day to day. Like if we can give a thousand dollars for 40 hours of work to somebody in, um, Nigeria, which is a middle age or middle wage income, you know, for them, why aren't we doing that? Uh, and so I, I really, so, there's so many different dynamics and that become possible when you have this kind of collective funding model that anybody can really benefit from. I took over maintenance of a project was created by Paul Betts, who had done quite a lot in the electronic ecosystem and it's reactive UI and it's nine years old at this stage. And, uh, Completely agree. Centralize your message. This is what we've been doing for the last two years. Um, our message had been spread between blogs all over the place, and people, when they're trying to consume the product, they are never getting a centralized, consistent message on how to use it. It was causing user frustration. So we centralized everything. I completely agree. Own the brand. Um, so uh, where we are now is the project died. The project legitimately actually died um, when Paul went off to join another company. Um, he was uh, paid to maintain the software. And as soon as he left uh, that company um, and that project, the project died. And we've been the last two and a half years reviving this project. Uh, we've just shy of $2,000 revenue, um, which is okay in a year. Um, Sean, I'm out here struggling and doing the motions, man. If you see me on Twitter or whatever, and you think that I could be more positive, you got any suggestions, man, I love it. Just let me know. Um, we've used the new Open Collective website uh, and redone our page uh, two days ago and defined the why. Um, I think it articulates, I made this, I came to this realization when I was talking about money between other people and, and like more in private between coworkers. Um, if people didn't know me, they wouldn't understand it. They would think that I'm in for the money. They don't understand the other motion. As soon as you lead with the money, you lose. I completely agree. Like they, if they don't know you and like your, your motivations behind it and you just talk about the money, the, the people are going to have the missing context. They're going to have it if it gets in for the wrong reason. So um, thank you, Sean. Um, something I'll add for ideas for other people is uh, Reactive UI, we now have a CRM. It's really, really weird. Um, but with that CRM, when people sign up to the newsletter, they get assigned a unique identifier in the CRM. And then when they click on a newsletter, it identifies them. And now I, I've almost got lead scoring going on. So when someone is using the website, I tag them. If they're hanging around on the contribution page, I mark them as a possible maintainer and I actually send an email out to them like a one-on-one -on -one interaction saying, Hey, if you're interested in contributing. So we actually got down to individual identification of people and like if someone's hanging out on Android, I go, Hey, what Android app are you making? And it's completely unscalable, but it's having early stages of success of building those long-term relationships.
Um, I think from a lot of the things that I've seen from uh, from you on Twitter have been actually pretty exciting. Like whether it be the uh, like the tweets about like the CRM that you talked about, or kind of the the different like the video publishing kind of planting the seed with that. Um, I think that's all been you know been really well done. Um, I don't know if there is an exact formula like. You know, I may spend four to five hours on Twitter a day just searching Webpack, and it may not yield any. Like, I may not even see as many tweets as I think I should, or um, and, and sometimes I'll just like I'll miss an entire day of doing it. Uh, it so it really depends. I mean, um, if the need or the growth for your project, uh, you know, isn't there, uh, or like let's say it's it's a pretty smaller project, then um, and maybe just a few few people use it, maybe they're not tweeting on it as much. And so maybe that the need for that kind of outreach doesn't exist yet. But maybe the need for like the best freaking documentation that's ever been seen on the human planet might be needed, you know, if you really want people to adopt to it. So it really um, is. And this is this is something interesting. Yeah. Um, so we've been around nine years, we use the reactive extensions, which means it's another level of people get scared of. So flying down uh, next month to write the docs conference to find myself a tech writer. Uh, I've got funds, but not enough to hire a tech writer, but maybe they know, or maybe they're interested in the project messaging. Um, how do you, this is just, yeah, it just feels like, like there's so much I give to the project in open source, right? And there does need to be sustainability and documentation is key and everything, but it feels like when I write the documentation, I'm giving away too much. Like I'm already giving like so much and all these services, but the documentation is really key. But if I was going to make something like Webpack Academy, that knowledge could be made sustainable. And if I had that revenue, I then could do documentation. But if I do documentation first, it feels like I'm giving away too much. Well, I, so like uh, if you've seen the kind of the, the Webpack, if you've watched any of the Webpack Academy courses, like I've basically created them based on the documentation that we've written. I think, um, for me, video learning is kind of more of a premium um, feature, I guess, for an open source project. Uh, I think that when it comes to documentation, I think it's really important because not only do you have the opportunity to just have something that anybody can really touch and it may be easier for them to be involved in changing, but you also open up the opportunity like uh, to have people from other countries be involved for doing translations and things like that. Like we have um, like I started maybe about seven months ago, a project called Webpack China. And so if you were to go to the Webpack docs page and you click at the top right, you actually see the Ch a Chinese link. Um, and this was a group of nine maintainers who work for pretty well-known companies in China, like Tencent and Alibaba, um, and even smaller companies in Beijing. Um, and they were just people who were passionate about being involved in a project and having responsibility. And so these nine people became the maintainers of this Webpack China. And I said, you know, you have really, it's one, like, I have, like you have two goals. One is to just enjoy what you are doing. Like, if this is what you love, please do it. And if not, go find something else that you love, or I can help you in open source, find something different. Um, and then two is uh, be leaders and represent kind of Webpack, um, you know, as Chinese developers. Um, the ecosystem is completely different there. Uh, whether it comes to funding models or platforms or things that are used in social media. And so represent those people um, who are authorities on the project. Um, and, you know, they, they created an entire documentation page. They own a WeChat channel um, that I try and stop in once, you know, once a month or three times a month to, to say hi and, and uh, you know, just get feedback from people. And uh, it's been really successful. Like, I, you know, China is our number two most consumed users from our docs, um, from our project. Um, and we're just about to start one for Africa called Webpack Africa. So, you know, there's 1 billion people who are just about to get on the internet for the first time. And so uh, I think Prosper Omanura, I think his name is, uh, you know, he, him and a few other people are, we're, I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did with Webpack China and create these leaders who um, you know, are local and known by their communities so that we can continue to spread the message in the image. I run a public CDN called Bootstrap CDN. It does 
1.65 petabytes a month. And the S3 bill alone is $700 a month just from the transfer. And we have a 99.9% .9 cash hit ratio on the CDN. If I didn't have an in-kind sponsor for those, um, there's no way we would be able to afford it. So what I'm trying to get at is, is that there's a lot of companies out there that if you give them some exposure on your, in your docs or your readme or your this and that, they will hook you up. Um, but you, you know, you got to give them a little business value here and there. But for the most part, I mean, I mean, if you look like how many different hosting companies there are and cloud providers and this and that, they're always trying to one up each other. But if they're the ones that are getting their logo in the README on a on a project that's twenty two thousand stars, that's just like drop the mic stuff. So in kind sponsorships, Sean Larkin, please let me know what you think about that. Man, you are so right. It's ridiculous. Like, uh, and maybe that's one of the things I didn't touch on is that like instantly by being a backer or a sponsor, like you get to have your mark, like instantly on not only our docs, not only our GitHub readme, um, but I think also on other, re other readmes as well. So like if you go to webpack.js.org and you scroll down, you see like we've had to even create these like segments now of like gold sponsor and silver sponsor, um, you know, and, and like you, every single backer uh, who's ever backed us in Open Collective shows on our docs page. Um, and it just kind of reinforces that idea that literally like every single one of these contributions is so, so, so important. Whether it's the, uh, you know, the CEO of Stripe, who secretly is on here, um, but I don't really public, you know, I don't publicly state it for 10 bucks. Um, to, you know, Capital One, who is our first sponsorship. And, you know, I think a lot of times, like there is huge, even AG Grid, another open source project that I, the only reason why this happened was we, I started talking at a conference with them at uh, like in Copenhagen. I was like, hey, I mean, you guys are trying to build your enterprise. You know, um, we have like X amount of hits on our documentation and you could, you know, instead of spending $20,000 to sponsor one conference, you could spend $20,000 and, you know, and essentially have millions of hits uh, or impressions on our docs page or, or whatever. And so uh, even today, like they talk to me and they say, you know, we still get 50 to 100, you know, uh, redirects and click throughs and conversions on it, you know, daily. And so it's super, super, super beneficial to have things like that. So yes, uh, like a thousand times, yes, absolutely. Uh, even just like to have, not only for the individual, but even for the people themselves or the projects themselves to have that kind of easy marketing or more impactful marketing than let's say conference sponsorships. Let's say you really want to get really involved in, in Webpack and start using it, but your company doesn't use it, right? So the only use case you have is to use it at home, but you're not building an application or like a personal project that has, you know, tons of JavaScript files and something you wouldn't need Webpack for. How can you actually start getting up to speed with it for like personal work when you're, when you're not using it eight, nine, 10 hours out of the day? Um, I mean, of course there's like the typical like paths that we say like, um, you know, going through like our standard documentation flow or learning flow. Um, but if you're just saying like, I want to contribute, but I have no idea how it works, but I still give a shit and I really, 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 you know, I want to help. Um, like I usually say message maintainer, or DM a maintainer or uh, like, like tweet at me. Um, I even have like, so something that I, I really want to finish, which I haven't yet is a medium publication series called, so it's like medium.com slash webpack slash contributors dash guide. And so um, basically I wrote two articles uh, and hopefully I'll get to the other two, but um, that basically show like everything you would want to know as a first time, like I want to contribute, but I don't know how. And so like, that's what these articles are supposed to answer. Like, here's an overview of our ecosystem. Here's what like these packages in our, our repos do. You might like these if you like working on a parser, or you might like these if you love technical documentation, 
or even just like writing error messages or, um, you know, if you like testing or smaller scope things. And so like, uh, you know, I think that's one of the first things I like have new contributors take a look at. And I'm like, at least take a look at the first article and then message me again and be like, I think I know what I like or want to try. Um, and then I think something else is just like, choose something or like, I usually ask people like, tell me what you enjoy. Like, tell me about yourself. Like, what kind of programming do you like? Do you like working on parsers or compilers or do you like, you know, doing some functional programming or do you like working on like infrastructure? Um, you know, and that, that gives me an idea of like, what project could I, you know, point you towards that will, uh, that would get you to stick with it long term or have more self direction. Because a lot of times what's so challenging for me is being able to manage 100 repos on two GitHub orgs and keep up uh, like hand holding is probably one of the most costly things. And it's not that I don't mind it. It's just that um, it's hard for me to keep up with all the different like after a few people, it then becomes unscalable for just me to do. And so I try to get find ideas that for things that people really love to do, uh, because then they're going to be one more confident to they're going to enjoy and want to push the boundaries on what they can do in their abilities. And uh, it really just allows things for to be more self directed. So like, I guess to boil it down, I'd say, you know, like, you know, reach out to a maintainer, tell me, you know, tell them what you love to do. And you know what, or what you want to help with. Um, and then, you know, ask like, what can you point me towards or what materials? Because then I'd probably show you all those things instead of like having to prod all those questions out of you. Sean, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. It's the, the role is to point people towards their heart. Um, and I'm also confirming people want to contribute, but they don't know how. They honestly don't know how. And the, the biggest revelation is actually, I don't know, you just do the thing that annoys you, right? If you want something improved, that's what you work on. That's right. I've definitely learned that lesson a few times. If it's really annoying you, that means it's your job. God dang it. That's yes. exactly it. That and that's so true. Because <laughs> I've created issues for people and we've had some good success with newbies, but they don't stick around. So I've stopped kind of trying to find newbies as per se and just produce short little videos talking about pain points and hopefully someone also has that same pain point. Yeah, like there's sometimes even like, uh, so like something that inspired me working at Microsoft is there's this image and it's a Venn diagram and in each of the circles it says what you like doing, what you do best and what creates value. And so like in the middle it says your purpose. And like I cannot agree like any more with that's how I feel about like a contributor for Webpack. It's like I want you to do what you love to do because you're going to do it best. Like what do you do best? Do you interact with people? Then like, let's help you interact with people on Twitter or work on a Twitter account or help triage issues or like, so finding out those three things, like what do you do best? What do you like doing? And then it's the maintainer's job to help find out how that can create value for your project. Um, and so like, I think that is super, super, super like the best way to distill it in my opinion for contributors and and how you can really, you know, get people to be long-term in, in working on your project. I never imagined that doing what I'd be doing today would even happen. So like I started out in tech support, um, but one of the things that I've carried with me, you know, through the entire time is uh, if you just, if you stay true to the things that you love to do and you, um, you make mistakes, but you celebrate them and you always put yourself out there um, whether it be, you know, you're rejected or not, no matter what, everything is a learning opportunity and growth. And so um, I think everything that, that I've tried to do or failed at or succeeded at has, has been that model with Webpack. And um, so, you know, I would encourage people to do the same thing and not question, you know, what can be possible. Uh, I think we even said like, our work would be done if we had a quarter of a million dollars for this project to be funded. And um, like, I feel like we're just getting started now uh, with the things that are behind the scenes and, and stuff that, you know, we'll be announcing down the road. And, uh, and so like open source has a, a whole bunch of many blessings, including, you know, open collective and how amazing that you, you all have been for us. And so, you know, 
if you want to continue to grow your project, always have an idea of where you want to take it and just have users, like your users make up your entire project. And so, you know, always have them in mind no matter what. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate, I really appreciate Thank you for having me. Yes, and a big thanks to everybody who came and participated and asked questions and listened. <laughs> I appreciate all of you, all of you out there. Um, like I said, I will be doing a write-up of this and we'll publish it on the Open Collective blog, so keep an eye out for that. Um, Sean is very accessible on Twitter if you haven't picked up on that, so I'm sure if you have follow-up questions, he'd be glad to be tweeted at or, or contacted. Hashtag um, Webpack works, but also you can DM me and I'm a little bit more async on DMs, but always feel free to do so. And I'll respond to them eventually, uh, usually in a, a few days at the latest. Awesome. And feel free to get in touch with us at Open Collective as well if you have any questions or need some advice or support with your fundraising or whatever you're up to. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.